Today is the fifth day of the February 1986 seven day retreat. And we will continue talking a bit about thinking. We talked yesterday about how thinking emerges from remembrances. Remembrances always being partial. One always remembers just part of a scene. Just what was one what one was involved with, what one was interested in, or what was upsetting to one. Memories are always partial, they're never the whole. So thinking coming from remembrances, remembrances are partial, is partial. Our past experiences, things that, is, that have happened to us, an hour ago or years ago in our childhood, they always remembered partially. So the thoughts coming from those memories are partial. The image we have of somebody is according to what that somebody did or say, or what we know about this person, which is partial. The image we have of a person is never that whole human being. The image one has of oneself as being this or that intelligent or dumb, successful or a failure, or one's attachments to groups, religious, political, ideological, is never the whole, it's always partial. What I see myself as being in one situation may be different from what I see myself being in another situation. It's always partial. Does one see that? An example comes to mind that happened this past de December during the retreat in Germany. The retreat place was located in a country which was essentially flat. But there was a dirt road leading away from the house with an embankment rather high embankment, and a little path led up to the top of this embankment. And from there one could look right across a vast field that had been neatly plowed. Snow had fallen, so there were these ridges of white and brown. And the field was bordered quite at a distance by forests on two sides. And since the land was flat, there was sky, 
as far as the eye could see. There was a person at this retreat who was born of Jewish parents, not in Germany, but who had an intense, had, has always had an intense dislike of Germany and the Germans. So much so that the few times that she would have to be in Germany when she couldn't help it, she felt practically ill, sick. From all the remembrances, not in her own life, but what had been told to her by her parents and friends. And she hadn't come to these retreats, but this time she came partly to question into this whole thing there, which was really incapacitating, because she lives in a country which is not far from Germany. And during the retreat, she told me in a meeting that she'd walked up that little path of the embankment and stood there looking out. And she said, I, I, I can't put into words to you what happened because there were no words. It wasn't a field, it wasn't forest, it wasn't the sky. And that wasn't me. And in asking her whether there was Germany or the Germans, she just laughed and shook her head and she said, those are just ideas. Those are just words, names. allows the imagination to play for a moment, what would happen to all human beings if they could forget or drop their names and identifications with their race, creed, color, nationality, ideology. Maybe then for the first time there could be peace on earth. This is, is used for an example to show how thought divides inevitably, inevitably. It is in its nature. It is partial and it parts. It creates apartheid. Inevitably. It cannot do otherwise. That's the nature of thought, to be incomplete, partial, and divisive. Science which explores the universe and matter, the nature of things, trying to find the truth of what everything is made out of, how everything functions, the laws.
underlying movement. Every, every article that one may read in a scientific journal starts and ends with a statement that this is just so little we know, but there's so much more to find out. And the more we the more science fragments and becomes specialized, the more there is that one does not know. With each new instrument, a new aspect of reality is revealed, and the observer who looks through that instrument divides up reality and affects it cannot even study it in its very nature because his impact and the impact of his instrument already affects what is observed. Thought cannot find the whole truth. It cannot find wholeness because by its nature it is incomplete and divisive. We're not, let's leave the whole area of practical thought out of this discussion here, this consideration, and keep with this psychological thinking, I am this, you are that, mine and yours, which is the, the root of all of our problems and in interrelationship. Yesterday, we were talking about the difference between thinking and seeing, that in seeing there is no thought. But as soon as thinking takes over, it abstracts by a name, and then comes the psychological reaction to what one has seen, and one finds oneself in the narrow groove of one's likes and dislikes, preferences, choices. Which is cerebration, the activity of brain with its interrelated emotions. And one is removed from seeing what is actually there. Can one observe this as it happens in the mind? So nobody needs to tell one, so one can see for oneself the effects of thinking and reacting according to past remembrances and patterns and habits. How it divides us inwardly and outwardly. One person brought this question up. I'm sitting, or oh, they're sitting, and a thought pops up, a fantasy. And there's awareness of that thought having popped up. One is aware, there's attention. And one also realizes that if this thought is to continue, it will be just 
going on and on and on, giving birth to more and more thoughts. And a mushrooming fantasy is in the making. And this person said, to stop that from happening, I feel there is still an effort involved. It is not effortless, as you talk about this effortless awareness. The thought comes up, it's seen, and it's realized that this will be an endless fantasy. One sees it in the making, and yet to stop it, there's effort. What is this effortless attention? Or what is this effort? First of all, there must be clarity whether it's really seeing a thought come up or whether there is a reflection about the fact that one has been thinking. Maybe there's an instantaneous perception that there's a thought, but immediately there comes the habitual reflection, I'm thinking and I shouldn't be thinking. Because thinking leads to endless fantasies. I don't want any more of those, I've been doing it for four days. <laughs> I want something else to happen for once. <clears throat> this is thinking in patterns, according to remembrances. And then comes the thought, I must cut off this line of thought, I must interrupt it, to be free of it, to be without thought, because only without thought can I see something. There's more thinking, you see that. More thinking according to what one has heard, read, remembered. Something else has also taken place, and we talked about that yesterday. The thinking process has divided itself up into somebody who is doing the thinking and who can control the thinking. It is again the birth of the me, the I, which thinks it can do something and feels it ought to do something. Does one see that that itself is a product of thinking? I shouldn't have thoughts. I can control them. I must control them. If I control them, I may get a certain result. Can one see that these are thoughts? And that there is the thought that these originate from a thinker or a doer or an observer. That there is an observer of these thoughts who can do something about them. And what is this thinker, this doer, this observer? other than image, thought, remembrances. But being there, emerging out of the stream of thinking, there is a division in the thinking. Me and my thoughts and therefore conflict. Either I shouldn't have them, or why shouldn't I have them? Conflict with some 
imagined authority who says, don't have thoughts. Control your thoughts. Be free of thoughts. Can one see how the emergence of the thinker or the observer creates this conflict with what is, with, with what is happening? A popping up of thoughts or thoughts giving way, uh, giving birth to more and more thoughts. That's what's actually happening. That's a fact. And then the division, the, the conflict with it. I shouldn't have those, which is also a thought. And at the same time, the feeling of I-ness in there, I am that. The owner, of the producer of those thoughts and the controller of them. Can one look at this? Often people say, it's so boring to sit. <laughs> but all of this is going on. Can one decipher it, see it for what it is, so that one is not torn, ensnared, or entangled in all these habitual ongoings of the brain and the body who always answers to every, every thought. It answers unavoidably, inevitably, with a, a sensation and an emotion, a reaction to any kind of a thought that can be seen as it happens. The person spoke of effort, that there is an effort to put an end to this emerging fantasy, which has been caught pretty much at the beginning. It's seen, and yet to stop it, there seems to be effort involved. One has to be clear what one means by effort. Whether it is just the functioning of energy, the energy of awareness, or whether there is the willing, the willpower exerted on what is going on, which comes from this observer or the doer, the thinker, the entity that feels it has these thoughts and has the capacity to, to do something about them. And then habitually, by learning as old as, as we are, we think we have to use effort to change something. Why, why would we have to use effort? Why can't the seeing of the thought be the ending of the thought? If effort has to be exerted, I think in any matter, there's a resistance. Without resistance, why would there be ever any effort? So, one sees how sensitively and subtly the attention needs to be to detect whether there is resistance.
the resistance may be, let me go on with my fantasies. This is what is enjoyable. We touched upon that yesterday, when, or the day before, when all systems are go to, to flow with the desire, with the fantasies and the, all the physical counterparts of it, then to say, what is going on? What is this? There's resistance to that. Unless the, the need to find out is so strong that no matter how great the pleasure is, one will look. One has to, there's no choice, one has to examine this right now as a, a real juicy case to examine. A live, a live thing, not just an example that is being talked about, but here it's happening. To go with a, a beautiful fantasy. So, if one talks in terms of the energy of the pull of the fantasy and then the, then the looking, the, the wondering, what is this, what is this desire, what, what is its very origin and, and nature, there may be a change of energy from going with the desire to looking. But it's not no effort. It's just a different energy, or a turn around, turning around of it. But if there's resistance to stopping what one is enjoying, then to stop it needs the effort of the observer. And the observer is not seeing, the observer is thought. I must not fantasize, I should get to clarity. After all, that's what I came here for and spent a lot of money and time for. I must get clarity. Against the pull to fantasize, as resistance and effort. Is, does one see that? say, well, how could, how could this ever be without effort? What is, what is this awareness which sees and the doing is in the seeing? It's not a separate action, not an intention, not an exertion of will, and no observer there to judge and to plan or intend not to pursue this, but rather to pursue that. This is the choosing observer. But at awareness is without choice. It is without will and it is without effort. And it is without the intention to bring about a result. It is not partial. It doesn't come out of memory. It's the whole thing. Not fragmented by this self-center who wants something, who wants many things, not just one thing. Many conflicting things. So let us say there is this awareness. We're not talking about length of time. Let's not bring in any conflicts. There is a seeing. Which is whole, which is not self-centered. Therefore no expectations. No wanting a special result. It's 
just being there. Everything just being there as it is, inside and out. And something is seen that reminds one of something. I'm using an example that occurred to me years ago. It was very vivid. I was driving to Rochester from Tanawanda through quite a beautiful countryside, quite flat. And on the horizon, the sun was already going down, there was this line of billowing clouds, not very high, a low wall of white clouds, a little gray haze underneath, which immediately brought the remembrance of Switzerland, where I've lived and done some wonderful hiking in the mountains. There's just, when one's in Switzerland, there is a natural love of mountains. One can't help it. it it's there. It's, it's in the air. So this line of white clouds reminded the brain of Switzerland. And there was an immediately felt desire to climb into those memories of mountain climbing or hiking. And all the nice memories connected with it. And yet without any intention or willpower or vows or anything of that kind, it was quite clear that with that one was going from something that was not limited or bounded to something very narrow. Yeah, narrow. It was a memory channel, it's clear. A narrow memory channel and away from the driving, the steering wheel, whatever was else there that was all not important anymore. It wasn't seen. What was seen was the movies in the, in the little projection room upstairs. And to seeing that was, was the end of it. There was no act of renunciation or denial, or whatever one, terms one has found for these activities of will. Actually, in looking at it, the renunciation would be to give up being with no special channels, no special desires or ideas, but being there with everything that was going on inside and outside of the car. No division. This does not one does not need to tell oneself to value that. It, 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 it does that on its own. It is sufficient in itself. So in sitting and seeing a thought come up, can one observe without 
wanting to direct the show in any way or manner. It, the show will reveal itself. How the mind functions and operates in channels, in fragmentation, or in wholeness. If one wants the wholeness, that's a channel. There's the wanter, who is separate from what he or she wants. And all the conflict in the world lies in that gap. So can one try to find out what that wanter, that thinker, that observer actually is, whether it is really something separate or just the idea of separation of thoughts. To, to come upon that oneself, no one can do it for one. That's the beauty of it. We don't have to enter into any dependency relationship. We don't have to perform any ceremonies to see that. It has nothing to do with the other. We treasure our channels. And thought says, oh, what will happen if I have to give them up? What, what will I have left? That's the limitation of thought to think that and the limited imagination of what will be if they are of these if these channels are seen for what they are. Thought cannot figure it out. It can't. It, it'll try to at any time to figure out what will be if that's what we're doing all the time. What if it rains forever? Right now it's sunny. Tomorrow we will talk about what if I die? What if I don't continue? Thought can't figure it out, but it, start, it tries to. We have learned to completely put our trust in thought that it can solve anything. And it gives us something to do. It gives us a certain sense of security to be thinking along merrily or unhappily. about mostly but about ourselves as our favorite topic <laughs> <laughs> it's so narrow and while we're in that little narrow thing we think that's all there is <laughs> that's why it's nice to have a countryside where one can go out for walk doesn't mean one doesn't take this narrowness along. But it helps to climb up to the top of a field and look around day or night. And at least spatially sees, see ones and feel ones utter insignificance. I remember once watching on, on television a, a Japanese sumi, sumi master who was painting. He was teaching in eight easy lessons how to do. 
it was it was really lovely to watch. He was so accomplished. And then the camera would switch over to the to the sweating students. <laughs> <laughs> And he would tell what a, a good Sumi painting is composed of. He said, it's always the earth and the sky. I don't know whether it was a third element. Usually there are three. <laughs> Maybe that's the third. So there's the earth and the sky, and maybe a tree or a mountain. <laughs> And then these, these tiny little people, and he says, that's just accessory. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't feel this way. We feel everything else is accessory to us. We will end here for today.